Hi everybody and welcome to my channel. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about Daniel Khalif, the escaped prisoner who escaped from Wandsworth Prison on Wednesday morning, which was two days ago. Well, before I get started, just want to say a massive thank you to all my subscribers and my Patreon members. So as promised for my Patreon members, the shout out, so my newest members are Alan Young, Milo Wolf, and Neil Rowley. And my existing members are Donna, Jerry Lee Radford, Michelle Jowett, Roy Willis, Tom O'Hagan, Jessica Milestone, Tor Holman, Julie Port, Blair Piggin, David Glover, James Franklin, and David Earl. Now, thank you all for joining my Patreon and becoming Patreon members. Now, if you are wanting to join this Patreon and be a member of my exclusive content, Go down into the description and click on the link only if you want. And this is access to exclusive content, daily updates, and a general chat section for all the members to have general chat amongst themselves and myself. But getting back into the video, Daniel Khalif is an escaped prisoner who is being classed as or called in the press a terrorist, an escaped terrorist. And again, from my point of view, this is just scaremongering from the UK press. A terrorist is on the loose and has escaped from prison, putting everybody on high alert, trying to scare members of the public into thinking that there's an imminent threat from a terrorist. Now, Daniel Khalif is 21 year old and he's been in the army since 2019 and I don't know the ins and outs, but everyone's got their own opinions, and this is my opinion. He's been in the army, and something might have went on in the army where he's fell out with his comrades, he's fell out with the bosses or whatever, and he's went and planted fake bombs in the army barracks. So this is not something where he's went out into the public and tried to set off explosives as they're trying to make out. It's been in an army barracks and he's planted some fake explosives and probably trying to scare members of the army, the bosses, who he's probably had a fallout with. And in my eyes, he's not classed as a terrorist as such, like ISIS and Al-Qaeda were posing imminent threat. This is what I'm thinking has happened. And obviously he's been caught for it and he's been put into prison. And this is also my reasoning behind it, because he's been put into prison, a Category B local prison, Wandsworth Prison, the same as my local prison, Durham, an old Victorian prison. And he's been put on remand inside of here. Now, if the courts, the prosecutors, the army, everybody involved, if they actually thought that Daniel Khalif was a terrorist, a proper terrorist, like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, he would not have been placed in a local prison on remand. He would have been sent straight to Belmarsh unit, category A, high risk. He wouldn't have been allowed off the unit and he would definitely wouldn't have been working in kitchens in a local prison on remand. <clears throat> now, if you look back at other terrorists who have been remanded into custody, who have been caught, They've all went to either Belmarsh or one of the high security prisons on remand there. They've been cut here, high risk, which is classed as double cut here. They check on them every hour of the day. If they're banged up on the pads, every hour the flap opens, they check the pads to make sure that they're still in and they'll be monitored constantly until they get to court. Then when they get convicted, get sentenced, get back to prison, they'll still stay on category A, high risk, for a number of years before they even come off it because they're that high profile and that high risk. Now, Daniel Khalif is in a category B local prison. So what does that tell you? Well, that tells me that the authorities didn't take him serious as a terrorist. As I've mentioned, it happened on an army barracks and nobody knows what this fake explosive device was. It could have been a plastic hand grenade for all we know, like a kid's plastic hand grenade planted in one of the beds or something like that. Um, 
This is all speculation, by the way, but this is what I'm thinking about it, and this is my take on it. And, um, but looking at Daniel, he just looks like a young lad. Well, he is. He's a young lad. He's escaped from the prison, and he could blend in easily. He could go and get a haircut, put a cap on, put some tracksuits on. He looks like a teenager. He'll just blend in, and he'll go unseen. But again, like I've mentioned with the UK press, they've put his picture on, They've put his name and they've said terrorist. Now, when you see the name Khalif and you see he looks like he's from the Middle East where he's from Iran, that's where his parents must have came from. So when you see his face, you see his name and you see the word terrorist, you look at him and think he's an imminent danger, he's a terrorist. And you come to the conclusion sometimes in your head, you look at him and you think, well, he's foreign, he's got a name Khalif, he looks like he's from the Middle East you would immediately think that he's going to talk foreign, he can't talk English properly, or he's going to talk with a bit of an accent. But I bet you any money he's been born in this country. He talks like a cockney, talks like anybody else from London. But because of his name and the word terrorist and Iran, everyone comes to the conclusion that he's an imminent threat and he's a danger and he's a high-risk terrorist. When, in fact, he's not. He's probably low-risk. He's probably, I don't know, looking at him, he's probably a little bit, what shall we say, a little bit simple. He's probably, even though it said he's intelligent, what I mean by simple, I don't mean thick as in IQ simple. I mean he's not like intelligent as in like a clued up criminal. He's not going to be involved with the likes of ISIS and he's not going to be that way inclined in, in his mind. He's a, he's a British soldier or he was a British soldier. So that tells you that. He's part of the British community, and he's been brought across as someone the saying that he's been planted in the army, and he's gathering intelligence for Iran. Well, my honest opinion, I think that's just all bullshit. I think that, like I've mentioned, he's probably fell out with someone in the army, or he's had a dispute, he's been kicked out of the army, and he's put these explosives in just to put the frighteners on them, just to get a little bit of payback, and it's backfired on him, and he's ended up in prison. But he's the type of lad that's a, who doesn't look like your normal or your typical prison type. He's the type that's probably been in there. He's got a job in the kitchens. And by the way, a job in the kitchens has only goes to trusted prisoners, enhanced prisoners. And an enhanced prisoner is someone that's been shown a good level of discipline within the prison. He's had no altercations. And everyone that goes to prison, when you first land in, there's basic standard and enhanced all prisoners when they go into prison get put onto standard so everyone's a standard prisoner when you first arrive and depending on your behavior over the next four to eight weeks depending on where you get graded if you carry on to be disruptive within the prison and arguing with screws etc you will be put onto basic where you don't get no association you get half an hour out your part to go and have a shower once a day and that is it Standard just means that you're a normal standard prisoner. Everyone, the majority of people can just stay on standard um, and you just get the same as everybody else. But if you get put onto an enhanced prisoner because you've got good behavior, you get extra visits, you get better jobs. And for example, Daniel is working in the kitchens. And the kitchen job, by the way, in the prison is the most trusted job in the prison apart from a red band. A red band is allowed to walk around the prisons freely without any screws, um, picking up litter and different things like that. But the kitchen job, what Daniel had, is going to someone who is trusted. So everyone in prison as well has what's called a security file. And in that security file, there's all reports. There's um, <clears throat> different things get wrote up weekly. You get weekly reports. You, the screws put comments in. And obviously... In Daniel's report, it must have in his uh, any security file. Sorry, it mustn't have had down that he was a threat. He wasn't a security risk. So again, that backs up everything that I've said. If they had him down as a terrorist, they would not have him working in the kitchens as an enhanced prisoner with one of the luxury jobs, working with knives and working with what's called civilian workers in the kitchens, because the kitchen workers that are in aren't screws. They're not police officers. The civilians, so 
in prison when you someone's called a civilian. A civilian in prison is someone that works in the side of the prison that isn't a prison officer. So the civilians in the kitchens are obviously the chefs and what classes the chef's laborers who's in the kitchens helping. And Daniel's working in the kitchens with these civilians and you'll be getting to know them because, because they're not like screws. They seem to get on better with the inmates and have a better, what should we say, a better communications, a better morale. And this will what be going on in the kitchens. <clears throat> and just like in any kitchen, they have big butcher's knives, which are up to 12 inches long. And only the trusted inmates are allowed to use these type of instruments within the prison. So Daniel must have been a trusted inmate. And I believe that this has been an opportunistic escape. He's been in the kitchens and he's seen the van coming in daily. And at first I did think he might have just done it on the spur of the moment and quickly just went and run and jumped on it when he's seen it. But he's obviously seen it coming in every morning and he's had it planned in his head that he's going to take his chance and try and get on to this van and escape. So I believe he's had outside help because once the van's left the prison, Daniel's never seen again. So I think he must have been communicating with someone on the outside and this probably would have been through a prison phone because in the prisons, majority of the prisons now anyway, they have in-cell phones. So you've got access to your phone about from 6 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night. And because there's that many people in that prison, they will not be able to monitor the phone calls all the time. So Daniel's probably been speaking to a relative or a friend on the outside. Or it could have even been a pod mate. And he said... What his escape plan is, that he's going to jump on the van, get out, and someone will be waiting not far from the prison on the other side. So when it stops, the traffic lights or whatever, he's just dropped off the bottom of the van, jumped into the car, and gone. And I don't think he'll have left the country. He'll have, he'll have not have went to Iran like they're trying to presume. And he's not going to escape and be a threat to people. He's just escaped on an opportunistic escape. And he's probably just living with a friend or a relative nearby and in hiding. And he'd probably be frightened for his life being broadcast all over the UK news as a terrorist that has escaped from prison. But when it says he strapped himself to the underside of the van with some netting, I think what that would have been is the net bags. So in prison, you get kit bags, which at the end of the week, when you do your laundry, you've got net bags where you put all your laundry in take it down to the laundry. So these net bags, which are pretty strong, you can't snap them. He's probably had a net bag, put himself underneath the van, put the net bag over whatever's underneath and pulled himself under it. So he's just attached to the bottom of the van until the van leaves the prison. He'll have released himself onto the floor. The van will have drove off. He'll have jumped up and jumped into the car, probably the one behind the van. So that's where I think he would have escaped to or there would have been a car waiting nearby and he's getting out, ran and jumped. Because he's in his chef's uniform and his chef's uniform is a white suit, which is the same as this color top with long sleeves, top and bottom. And you've got to wear a hat when you're working in the kitchens, like a chef's hat. And the ones that I've seen and the ones that I've been in have always been a white cap with blue stripes, like a tartan type. Um, but I think it said on the press, this one was red. So I've never seen the red ones in prison. It's always normally blue. But they do have different colours for different levels of people in the kitchen. So he might have been like classed as the head chef or the head the head worker in the kitchen. Because there is like head workers in the kitchens that take control of the other prisoners and tell them what to do. So he might have had that one on. But if he's escaped and he's got that chef's uniform on, I don't think he would have just been walking around the streets like that because he would have been spotted. But another theory is in his kit bag or underneath his uniform, he could have had his clothes on. So as soon as he's getting out, he's took the uniform off, chucked it into a bag, chucked it somewhere, and then off he's went. But again, he would have had to have money on him for transport unless he jumped on the transport without paying for it, which could be a possibility. But um, I think he's had someone on the outside waiting for him and he's made his escape and he's had a lucky escape. But getting back to the prison, it showed you pictures of the prison and a couple of people on my Patreon channel have asked us and said, 
is just a legit picture of the prison. And it is a legit picture because these prisons, the old Victorian prisons that were built in the 1900s, are absolute shambles. They fall into bits. And as it's stated, the understaffed, there was 1,500 inmates in that prison, and there was only seven staff on the night shift. And that's probably seven different house blocks. I'm not sure the insides of Wandsworth, but there's probably seven different house blocks filled up with these 1,500 inmates. And there's one staff per house block that goes around on the night time and checks every single pad to see if everyone's in the pads do like what's called a roll call, a roll check. And they, um, again, these prisons that are that old, that they fall into pieces and there's that many inmates inside the prison because these cells were only decide, uh, designed for one man. So it's like a one man cell with 1,500 inmates. So this prison is probably only built to hold 750, and it's got 1,500 in because there's that many prisoners in the country, and it's overcrowded, and they've crowded them all into the prison, and they're understaffed, and they haven't got enough staff to look after the 1,500 inmates. Whereas if it was halved like it was supposed to be, and it was one person per cell, and they had 750 inmates, it would be a lot more manageable, and there would be a lot more chaos. Because I've also seen an interview with an ex-inmate from Wandsworth seeing that he was helping the new screws do the roll calls. So they had the rotor out with everybody's name on and the screw was actually saying to the prisoner, can you tell us who's actually on this rotor? So he's looking around the wing on association, taking people off who are in the prison or in the wing, sorry. <clears throat> and that is the state of the prison system. The UK prison system is an absolute shambles. It's overcrowded. It's understaffed. It's underfunded. And it's just only going to get worse. And it also said, someone came on and said, hey, I'm not surprised there's been an escape because of, like I've mentioned, the overcrowding and the understaffed. But again, a lot of these staff that they're bringing in have hardly ever been trained. They might have had four weeks training, 21-year-old lasses and lads, because 21-year-old, you're not, you're still a man or a woman. But you just, if you say a 21 year old, you say, oh, just a young lass or a young lad. So they're coming into the prison full of men who have been to prison any amount of time. Some of the lads that's in the 40s, 50s, they've been in the prison system since they were kids. They know how to manipulate the system, manipulate the screws. And you've got 21 year olds coming in off the streets who are just looking for a job. They've been offered a job in a prison. They've had four weeks training. They come into the system and they haven't got a clue what to do, what's going on. On these wings, the old Victorian prisons can be over, the overwhelming for a prisoner, a new prisoner coming in. There's a hundred and odd people on the wing, all out on association, all running around. Sometimes they'll only open half the wing at a time, but even 50 inmates running around, majority of them off the heads, looking for drugs, looking for things to do. And you've got these brand new screws and they're easily manipulated. So the prison system is failing massively because of things like this. Because like I've mentioned, if you've got a new prison officer come on the wing and they're overwhelmed with a hundred inmates running wild, and like I've mentioned, the inmates try and manipulate other inmates, they manipulate anyone to try and get what they want. And a lot of the time, these young screws are getting manipulated or they're getting offered money to bring things in. And it's happening in every prison across the country. And also the Welsh prisons here, HMP Berwyn, who I'm going to do, I'm going to do an um, uh, episode on that. That prison has actually had the largest number of inmate affairs with the prison officers over the past year. I think it was something like 20 odd screws have been caught having affairs. And these are the only ones that have been caught. And that is a massive prison that's overcrowded as well. But I'll talk about that on another episode. But getting back to this and getting back to Daniel, I think you'd be laying low. Um, and if he is with someone that isn't known to the authorities and they're hiding him away, he could just be lying low for a number of weeks. But because of the way the press have portrayed him and they're making him out to be some radicalized terrorist, which I don't believe he is, I could be wrong. But this is just my thoughts on it. And that was the reason why he's in Wandsworth Prison. But um, I believe 
that the way the press are pushing them and portraying them, there could be different groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda that will be watching this and they would love to get their hands on them, to manipulate them and use them to their advantage. But that's the way the UK press is pressing him towards because they could get a hold of him and say, come with us, we'll protect you, and they could use him to their advantage and push the sort of pushing them into terrorism because if the terrorists do, the real terrorists do get a hold of them and manipulate them and use them to their advantage, then it's just going to prove everything that I've said and the UK press is pushing them towards that. And again, this is all just my thoughts, my speculation, but I bet you I'm true and I bet you the majority of what I've said, everyone will back it up and they'll probably have their own thoughts on it. But I believe that Daniel will be caught within the next few days because the police are searching from high and low and <clears throat> it's only a matter of time until they track him down and it could be an ex-inmate that he was padded up with or something like that. But um, that's my thoughts on the escaped terrorist, or should we say escaped prisoner, who has had an opportunistic escape and he's on the run and he'll be caught soon enough. But he could even be living with the homeless. He's probably went and shaved his hair off somewhere. Or he could have even shaved his hair off that morning and covered it with his cap. So when he comes out, he's in disguise. There's a lot of things that he could have done, but we'll be finding out soon enough because I know for a fact he'll be caught soon, unless, of course, these terrorist groups get a hold of him and use him to their advantage. But I'll leave that one there for now, people. I've covered quite a lot in this episode. But if you are enjoying the content, remember to like, comment, and subscribe because 70% of my viewers are still not subscribed to my channel. So if you're not, go down, double check, click that subscribe button. Helps the channel grow. But again, thank you all for watching. Hope you have a beautiful weekend. Take care, everyone. Peace out.